Uh, so in the season of Advent, what we do is we're, we're looking back to what Jesus has done, and we're looking ahead to Jesus coming again. And so uh, if you came in, and uh, or not if, you are here. You, you did <laughs> metaphysically come in. Uh, so as you came in, you see we have this great wreath and candles, and maybe thinking, like, what are we doing? What is this? Is there now incense here at the journey? Not yet. Not yet. I mean, we could do incense eventually, right? That whole, like, sensory experience. Uh, so what we do in Advent, and they've done it for hundreds of years, is uh, you celebrate uh, the coming of Jesus in, with four different words. So hope, faith, peace, joy, and love. And uh, you light a candle each Sunday to signify that. So in our case, during the sermon on Sunday, I have, um, as long as this candle's burning, I get to preach. That's how it works, you know? So you should get shorter candles next time, and then uh, talk to Julie about that. So um, that's... That's a joke. I'm not going to preach that long. So what we'll do is each week I'll light a candle until the fourth week when all four candles get lit during the service. And then at the Christmas Eve service, we light a fifth candle. It's a white one. It's really big. And that's the candle for love. And, and we look uh, to all these words and we dig deep. So today, obviously, the word is hope. You're thinking, oh, that connects to the video. Exactly. It's all connecting together. So, uh, so I'm going to light the first candle this morning, uh, the hope candle. And this is totally going to work. We got it. We got it. There we go. So we light the hope candle, and then uh, now we're going to pray. And then I'll dig into the word. So Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you that hope is so much more than optimism, that hope is something that we, we have in you, and it's a, it's a powerful choice we make. So this morning as we look at your word, uh, help us to see that that choice is available to us today uh, through you, Holy Spirit, as we, as we listen, as we dig in. In your name, amen. So this morning, we're going to be in a couple different texts. Uh, the first one, you're going to want to open up your Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12 will be our main text uh, for all of our sermons on in Advent, and then we'll go from there in other ways. Uh, you will also, uh, you'll be pleased to know, some of you, I think will be pleased to know that uh, I'm not preaching every one of these sermons. So if some of you think, uh, man, Pastor Stephen preached a lot. Is somebody else going to get up? Yes. In the month of December, uh, we're going to have uh, J Pastor Julie preaching and Pastor Corey preaching, which I think will be uh, is really special for us as I love those women and, uh, and they're amazing. So that's coming up soon. Uh, so let's talk about hope. Talk about hope. Uh, I think as we dig into the holiday season, as we're here, uh, I know for me, what I've experienced even this past week, doing Thanksgiving, uh, this is my first Thanksgiving away from all of my family, so if you're new, I moved here with my family, my wife and my three kids in August from the Northwest, so from Olympia, Washington, so I have actually my uh, mother-in-law and father-in-law are here uh, for Thanksgiving, which is awesome, uh, you guys don't need to raise your hand, okay, there she is, yep. <laughs> Um, that's a Dottie and Stan, and they, they came and visited us, and, and that was awesome because, uh, you know, our whole family, everybody lives in the Northwest. So uh, what I found as I came into Thanksgiving over the past three days is the amount of emotion that's coming up is huge. I don't know about you, but the, the longer I'm alive, the more I've got amazing memories of the holidays, and I've also got really difficult memories of the holidays. And it's very, it's very challenging because I can't schedule when one is going to come. You know, you're, you're kind of like, I'm having a great day. Things are awesome. And then suddenly you just get slammed with some really difficult memory that happened 10 years ago. And you're like, I didn't schedule this. Here's what I scheduled. We're going to see Frozen 2 right now. I'm not going to process hard feelings. But you can't do that. You know, like you're, you're built as a human being that is... Uh, is going to process stuff as it comes. I wish I could schedule my feelings processing, but I can't. And you know, and if you're like me, then you've experienced the same thing. There's just stuff that comes up. And what it does, especially as I thought about this word today, is it makes me think like, where is my hope? What am I hoping in? And each time those those memories just hit me, was a, a realization of really where my hope was at really like, I think I'm hoping right now in this moment more in how much money I have or more in 
how strong my family connections are or more in um, how stable my job is. I mean, there's so many things we can hope in. So 1 Peter 1 says this. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving, they were serving not themselves, but you. So that means everybody that's gone before us in the Old Testament were actually serving us in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which an angels long to look. And there's this, there's this tension. Yeah, you know it. Every Sunday it's going to be there. There's this tension that, that we get in in the Bible of everything that happens in the Old Testament is pointing towards the coming of the king. Everything happening in the New Testament is saying the king has come and he's coming again. And so here in First Peter, and this is a text we'll, we'll continue to look at, they're saying, they're saying, man, everything that was spoken of is spoken of Jesus coming for everyone, but especially for us. They were not serving themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced. What has been announced? Well, it's been announced that Jesus has come, that Jesus lived the life we couldn't live, that he died on a cross in our place for our sins, that he rose again. And in this season, there's this whole element of a manger and a baby and how Jesus came and why is it important that Jesus comes as a baby in a manger? Like, what, what is all this about? And we're going to dig into that over the next couple of weeks. Because we need hope in our life. And people have needed hope throughout time. And so this morning, there's three things we're going to do. We're going to look back. We're going to look forward. And then we're going to be present. And so the, the other text I want to look at is also Romans chapter 5. So Romans chapter 5 is one of my favorite texts. In fact, when I was an intern, I memorized uh, Romans chapter 1 through 8. With I had an intern director who was just hard driving, and he's like, we are going to memorize half of the book of Romans. It's just crazy. I do not still have it all memorized, but I do still have uh, many parts of it. So Romans chapter 5, verse 1 says this, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And we saw that in the video, the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And there's going to be a lot of sufferings in this season. So we, I talked about at the beginning that there's, it's just a, there's just hard feelings that come up. Knowing that sufferings produce endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Hope doesn't put us to shame. Why? Because we're strong? Why? Because we're smart enough? No, because the love, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's given to us. God's love has been poured into our hearts. And as we move into this season and there's... There's a ton of gifts to buy. There's a ton of parties to go to. There's all this pressure and this weight that we put into the, the holiday and Christmas season. The love of God's been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, and that gives us hope. It gives us hope, and God wants to do something in us during the Advent season, and I think it comes, what he wants to do in us uh, goes through this Romans chapter 5, that he wants us to be able to rejoice in sufferings, because when you rejoice in a suffering, you, it produces endurance. When you struggle through that and you, and you call your people in your, in your community group or you call your friend and you say, man, I'm, I'm not doing well. And then they pray with you and they walk you through that. That produces endurance. Endurance produces character. What's character? Character is you're actually being changed. Where, where how you used to act, now you become different and you're not going to behave in the same way which then re you realize Jesus really is making me new from the inside out. And I, I, what I believe in this season God wants to do is, is do far more than give us a lot of happiness. It's more than that. I think there's a lot of happiness to be had, but I think there's real growth, and I think there's real healing, and, and there's brokenness that God wants to actually uh, give 
give us healing too. That's incredible. And so as we move into the holiday season, let, let's do more than just be happy. Let's do more than just do the parties and Christmas. Let's actually say, I want to end the year strong, and I want to actually develop something in myself where I'm, I'm different in 2020, not because I did the right thing, but because I yielded myself to God's will, and he actually changed me from the inside out. I think God wants to do that. So point number one, in Advent, we look back. And First Peter, that verse out of First Peter talks about this, uh, the prophets who prophesied about the grace. In Advent, we look back. Why do we do that? Well, first, we, we need to look back to know how faithful God has been. And as, I, and as I thought about this, I thought, questions for us. What has God done in your life? What has God done in your life? Not in somebody else's life, but in your life. It's very easy to look back at all the bad things that have happened to you. It actually takes work. It takes real, I got to sit and think and answer the question, God, what have you done for me? In 2019, God, what did you do? What miracles did, did you enact in 2019? And it's, we forget so easily. And in this season of Advent, in this season of, of longing, let's look back and let's answer that. What has God done in your life? I loved what Julie said during the offering of, of how God creates everything that we see and he even owns all that we have do you recognize that God is the creator of everything that you see? That God has given you everything that you have? Have you even taken the time, I think, to wrestle with God that if God's given me everything, then why has he given me suffering? You know, and as I wrestle through that, if the Lord's given me everything, that means he's allowed good things in my life and he's allowed the really hard things. And in the really hard things in my life, it has never served me to go yell at somebody else about the hard things in my life. I've never grown by going to somebody and grumbling a lot about my sufferings. But I have grown when I've gone to the Lord and then got really mad. And gone to God and actually said, I don't think this is fair. I'm really hurt. I need an answer. In fact, I think... God is so big. He's the only one who can really handle the depth of, I believe, our pain and our hurt and our suffering. In this Christmas season, when we look back, I thought about this. I thought, because um, it hit me this week, you know, we had, like, amazing Christmases and amazing holiday seasons. Then we had one seven years ago where, um, and I still have a photo in my office of Jessica and I. And we're like the skinniest we've ever been. We look amazing. Um, Jessica was like running all the time and I was super healthy and it was just awesome. And, and I look at that photo, it was taken in October and two months later, we miscarried. So in December, we miscarried. And then a week after we miscarried, I got laid off. And then three weeks after I, or actually it was a month after I got laid off, we miscarried again. And I remember in that season, so many opportunities to go to somebody and be like, this, is, this isn't fair. I can't believe. I can't believe this person did this. I can't believe that, um, that, that the nurse did this or that this happened. Or, you know, it was just all this pain and suffering. And when I finally started to get healing was when I went to God and just got real mad. And began to say, I, I, I don't think this is fair. I'm really struggling to see your goodness in this. I'm really wrestling to see any sort of, uh, of, of your grace in this, so help me. And I think in the Advent season, we need to look back, and we need to actually begin to say, well, what am I wrestling with, and have I gone to the Lord? Because he actually wants to love you and help you through that. that I don't know in the mysteries of how God works why you've gone through the suffering you've gone through, but I do know that God can actually bring healing. And that season I just told you about, it took Jessica and I years to get healing through it. Years of, of like, I think we're good, I think we're good, and then boom, you get hit with something, and you're like, I don't think we're good yet. I think we still need to process stuff. And so I just encourage you in this season of Advent, um, don't be afraid of negative emotions. Don't be afraid of hurt.
but actually go into it and look back and actually say, God, you're big enough for this. And I think as we do that, the joys you have are even greater. Because what, what I found is you're, you're not going to have the great happiness and joy that you want unless you actually start processing some of the pain that you have. And I wish it were different, but it's not. And man, that is just so hard. I want to have all the happy and good stuff and none of the negative. And I just can't. I, all the, the, my ceiling for joy is driven by how deep I'm willing to go into my pain. And so I encourage you to do that. Now, here's the other thing, because you're like, wow, this just started incredible, Pastor Stephen. I hope we're going to... I hope we're going to talk about other happy stuff. We are. Okay. Um, so we also, in Advent, we look forward because we have this candle of hope looking back to what Jesus has done. But we're also looking forward and saying, Jesus is coming. In Advent, we look forward. The prophets all say that God's going to provide for his people. Revelation 21 tells us that Jesus is coming. There's a new heavens and a new earth that are coming that God is actually going to wipe every tear from every eye, that all the pain and suffering we go through is, is actually going to be healed. But heaven is also this. Every joy you have now, you look at the head to heaven, and the joys you experience in, in heaven don't even compare, or the, the joys you have now can't compare to heaven. So think about your capacity for joy. Think about right now the greatest, joyful, most fulfilled moment you've had and then you look ahead to heaven and you realize heaven is in eternity of that, but to a degree you've never experienced. I believe a part of the reason why God is going to give us a new heavenly body, that, there's, that sin is going to be wiped away and there's a whole new body, it's because the amount of emotion and feeling and joy that we're going to have in heaven, this human body right now, as it exists, can't even handle it. And so the goodness you've experienced in this life, in heaven, it goes even more. Heaven is not just... It's, it's not this life, but a little bit better. It's a whole nother category. It's a physical world with no sin, a new heavens and a new earth. And we have that to look forward to, that the joys we have, God is wanting us to experience all those joys now. Because what I believe about looking forward is this, is that being saved, and I said this last week, I want to say it again because it's important, that being saved, coming to Jesus is not just about getting to heaven, it's about heaven actually coming into this life. And when the Bible talks about every tear wiped away from every eye, he's actually talking about that happening here and now. He's talking about us being in this world, bringing joy to people and bringing the kingdom to people more than just happiness. I think actually bringing hope to people who are really hopeless. You know, the, one of the greatest challenges in our culture today is depression and anxiety and fear. Generation Z is the largest generation since, it's actually a larger uh, generation than the baby boomers. And the greatest thing that 18 to 25 year olds and younger, so I think PJ is 12, he's my oldest, he's Gen Z. The greatest thing that they're all struggling with, <laughs> depression, fear, anxiety. Which, which leads to a hopelessness. And what do we have in the kingdom? But we have real hope. And we have an opportunity, I think, as we look ahead to begin to address, I think, real hurts in people. So the hope of heaven is real. Do you actually believe it? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that sarcastically. I'm saying have you sat and thought heaven is real. I do believe heaven is coming. And I believe heaven is coming in and through me right now. Do you believe you're a part of God's kingdom? I forget that I'm a part of God's kingdom all the time. In fact, uh, I wear a ring on my pinky because as royalty wears a, a ring on their pinky, and it seems silly, but I'm incredibly forgetful. And so I wear this ring because I remember every day I'm royalty. I remember about the kingdom. What does it mean that I'm royalty? It means I'm part of God's kingdom. It means all these things are true in this moment and true about my present and about my future. Do you actually believe you're part of the kingdom? Why or why not? What is it that's going on inside of your heart? As you look ahead, what are you hoping for? Are you hoping that your is the whole season driven by, I hope I get my Christmas bonus. Is the whole season driven by, I hope this relationship gets healed. God wants to do more than those things. I think God wants to give us those things, but then provide even more, even greater things for us as we look forward.
So in Advent, we look back. In Advent, we look forward. And then finally, in Advent, we are present. And uh, if, if any, anybody know anything about the Enneagram? Anybody heard of the Enneagram self-awareness tool? Yeah, good, 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 good. Uh, so in the Enneagram, there's nine types. We can't go into all the details. I'm a type eight, and a type eight's a challenger. But the thing about a type eight that's in, important for this sermon, there'll be other sermons, or we can have a meeting. I can tell you all about me, and you can tell me all about you. Uh, but here's why I'm bringing it up is, as a type eight, I live in the future. Like, my whole world is in the future. And, and that future is always bright. Like, there, there is never a negative future that I have in my mind. In fact, I get shocked when something in the present isn't working. Because a year ago, I already imagined it going really well. And so when I get to a present moment where something doesn't go well, I think, like, there's no way, like, my plan was perfect. And <laughs> I, I have total control over the situation. And, like, well, how is this not working? Like, how did this turn negative? So I live in the future all the time. And some of you, you live in the past. Some of you, you live in a blissful present. And man, praise God for that. But that is not the world I live in. <laughs> and, and Advent, there's this opportunity to be present. And being present is really important because of this. Because, and um, think about this for a second, that heaven is an eternity in the present. In heaven, you will never have to look back at anything negative because everything is taken care of. In heaven, you will never need to sit and think about a hopeful future because it's all taken care of. You're in heaven. So heaven is actually an eternity completely present. And what is it that the enemy tries to do every single day in our life but get us to remember things in our past? What does the enemy do? You are a failure. You didn't do that well. Or the enemy looks to the future and says, that's never going to heal. That's not going to go well. The enemy is constantly getting us to dwell in the past or in the future. And I believe where the Spirit of God wants us to constantly go back to, once we process the past, once we've dreamt about a hopeful future, is to be in the moment. Because that's where heaven is. And when we're present in a moment, we bring the kingdom in. We bring the kingdom into our moments. Heaven is an eternity in the present. And why do we get anxiety? We get anxiety in this season because we dwell in the past or the future. And it takes really hard work to be in the present. Being, being, I've never found that being present in a, in a Thanksgiving dinner, being present for a Christmas party, being present doesn't just happen. Because the moment I go into that place, I'm thinking about the next fun thing. I'm like the worst person sometimes because I'll go to a party that's really fun, and within an hour, I'm thinking, what's the next party that we can have? Like, where do we go next from here instead of just enjoying the present moment? This past, uh, actually, oh gosh, was it a year ago? I think it was maybe two years ago. I, I, was, I started getting... A massive anxiety in the pulpit. I, I had a sermon where I got up to preach, and and I was so anxious, and then I got just really arrogant, thinking I'm just gonna like figure it out and do it. And I was up preaching in front of like 200 people at a youth, is a college group, and the spirit of God physically stopped my body, and like I couldn't move. And God's like, you just need to step off the platform. Because I was so, like, I'm so anxious. I'm thinking about the future. This all has to go well because it means this and it means this and it means this. And the Spirit of God was like, there's things happening in the moment that you're completely missing. It was one of the most awkward moments I've ever had. If you think of, like, if, if I just said, hey, guys, uh, hey, Jeff, why don't you come back up and play? And I'm just going to walk off. I had to walk off the platform and the band played a couple songs. I went to the bathroom, looked in the mirror, and I was so mad. I was like, how dare you? I have, I have an agenda here, Lord. And God's like, you're already, you're already in the future. And you've missed everything that I'm doing in this present moment. So I humbled myself, repented. After 10 minutes, came back, preached a much shorter sermon. But I learned in that moment the hard way that God is speaking to us in the present moment. Yes, there's hopeful visions and futures he gives us. Yes, there's healing in the past that he gives us. But I think... 
He wants us living in the present moment and thinking, God, what are you doing right now? And how can I be a part of what you're doing? What are you doing and how can I be a part of it? Now, I'm not saying as you're thinking, I would never want the Spirit of God to do that. Well, you are probably never going to have that because you're probably not as stubborn as I am, and that's okay. Um, so what does this mean for this season? I think for this season it means uh, God wants us to step into this season, and there's four things that I do to help me be present. And this, is gonna, this may seem really uh, simple, but I'm telling you, being present in a moment is incredibly hard. And so I've, I learned this actually from some teachers that I have who taught me a lot about the Enneagram, and they taught me about being present in the moment. So I'm going to teach them to you because they're incredibly helpful. There's four things. You ready? Number one, show up. Show up. Everybody say show up. Show up. There you go. If you want to be present in the moment, uh, you physically have to be there. That's really easy, showing up. So, so if you want to be at the if you want to be at the Christmas party and be present, you actually have to physically be present. So you have to show up. Showing up is the easiest one, unless you're super introverted, in which I just gave you the greatest challenge. Showing up is probably the hardest thing. Uh, here's the other thing that if you want to be present, pay attention. Pay attention to what's happening around you. Listen, listen to what's going on around you. So you got to physically show up, and then you actually have to like. Listen to other people. What are they saying? Or are you just thinking about what's going on in your mind and what you want to do next? But man, showing up and being present or showing up and paying attention, which we've all been there right at Thanksgiving dinner when you're like, that person is not paying attention. That person is lost. Like they are not in the moment right here. And they're missing what's happening. So here's the third thing. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Be honest. Uh, not all the facts, right? Have you ever been in a family gathering when somebody's like oversharing all the truth? Like, no, no, no. We don't need to do that. But you need to tell the truth, which means you got to show up and then you got to pay attention. And then when that person says, How are you? You don't say, like, oh, I'm good. You know, everything's good. Do you actually, if you want to be present in the moment, you got to be present. You actually have to say, like, I'm here and I'm struggling. Now, I don't want to get into all the details of why I'm struggling, but. I am here, I do care about you, and I'm having a hard day. That's telling the truth. It's not giving them all the details because not everybody gets to know all the details of your life, but I think telling the truth allows us to be present in that moment. Otherwise, we get so stuck in all the stuff happening in our head. And then here's the other one, and this is, my, this is the most difficult thing for me, is don't get attached to the results. Don't get attached to the results. What results, Pastor Stephen, would you be thinking of? I don't know. Whatever results you planned on happening in that moment. Like you had a great Thanksgiving dinner, which I know some of you cooked it. Some of you enjoyed it. And everybody had a result. I don't know about you, but it's really difficult to be present in the moment when you're overly attached to the results. Because then every your whole joy is going to be rooted in whether or not those things happen. Instead of... Don't get attached to the results. You can't control how people are going to respond. You can't control how all the different factors are going to happen. You need to show up in that moment, pay attention, tell the truth about you, and don't get attached. And man, like, honesty time, like, man, I'm so attached to the results. Every single Sunday, I'm thinking, like, how many people are showing up? What's the response in the room? Like, I, I've like therapy after church every Sunday with, like, you know, not a lot of people responded, but I'm okay. Like, where am I at? You know, even, it, it was crazy. Last week, it was, it was an amazing moment that I desperately needed from my wife. We wrapped up a 12-week sermon series last week, and, and I came home, and I was feeling like, man, I crushed it. This is amazing. And, I, and I'm sitting at the dining room table, and I look at my wife. She's amazing. Her name is Jessica. And I was like, yeah, we wrapped up a 12-week series. Like, you know, it's like, wh what do you think? You know, and she's like, yeah, it's not that big of a deal. I was like, <laughs> it's not that big of a deal. Like, I was like screaming in my head because I'm so attached to the results that, that we did this 12-week series. And, and my wife says, it's not that big of a deal. He was like, and then she could see on my face. She was like, we're going to be here our entire lives. You're going to preach thousands of sermons. 
in the scheme of things, you did a good job, but it's also not that big of a deal. And I, like, I had to like get up, go to my bedroom, and like get time. And I was like, Lord, like I'm like, how dare you give me this woman who's not like, you know, just full on, like I am not in a good mood. And, and Holy Spirit's like, you're not that big of a deal. Like you're, and, and it was great because I was like, you're right, I'm not that big of a deal. And God's like, I'm a huge deal because I'm God. And you're not a big deal because you're just a human being I created. But you get to enjoy this great community. You get to be a part of a great sermon series. Why are you trying to steal glory by getting your wife to say, you're amazing? <laughs> oh, wow. Great sermon series. You know, I'm just, what was I going for? I was going for, I'm attached to the results. And I needed that. And it was great. And she listened to the Holy Spirit. And I love that because she was able to say, she wasn't mean about it. She was just like, it's not that big of a deal. But it was a big deal to me. Why? Because I'm attached. I'm attached to those results. How many people have the same experience of like, hey, how do you think that went? Somebody's like, oh, it's okay. And then you're like, never going to talk to you again. Can't believe you. <laughs> that, that turkey was amazing. That was the best stuffing ever made. You didn't like it well enough. You're attached to the results. And you get attached to the results. And then what happens? You don't want to be present. Now, now you're like, I don't want to be with these people anymore. I don't want to be around this anymore. And so these four things, I think at, at any moment you can be struggling with one of them. But as I have used this over the years, it has helped me snap me back into reality to be like, um, okay, I'm, I, I did physically show up. I am here. But how many people have seen somebody show up and they're just like a log? Like they are not present at all. I mean, they did the first thing. But you've got to walk through this. Think about it. Or, or you just lie the whole time. You know, I'm just going to show up. I'm going to listen to everybody, but the moment they ask me a personal question, I'm not going to tell the truth about myself at all. And then, but you don't make connections when you do that. So I encourage us, be present in this season because God has things he wants to do in us and through us this season. There are things, um, think about right now, there are people in your life who you desperately want to see life-changing. You desperately want to see hope and growth and change. And think, the Spirit of God wants that even more than you. Holy Spirit wants goodness for them even more than you do. And when you step into a moment and you're actually listening and asking the question, Spirit of God, what are you doing in this person's life? How can I come alongside what you're doing? Incredible things happen. And I'm not, I'm not saying... Because you may be thinking, does that mean I need to lead all my family to Jesus at Christmas? No. I mean, if that happens, great. But what I mean is, you can come into Christmas, you can come in all these holiday settings and have that really awkward conversation with that relative that you don't really like, but instead be thinking, God, what are you doing in this moment? I'm here. I'm uncomfortable. And you're doing something. How can I be a part of that? And you watch as you, you don't mention Jesus at all. But the way you love and the way you care and how you're present changes your relationship and gets them thinking differently than they were thinking. There's huge things that I believe that can happen in this season as we do that. So in Advent, we look back. Why do we look back? We're, we're looking back to say, what have you done this year, God? I mean, if you just take the exercise with your community group or with somebody that you love and just say, um, and write the list down before you come of, Here's all the good things God did in my life this year. Really, and write them down. And if you as a group just like talked about all the good stuff that God did, you'd find yourself saying, wow, God really is faithful. He really is good. Oh my gosh. And then you begin to look forward and you, and you begin to see what, what hopes and dreams do you have for, for 2020? Because there's great things God has for you. A hopeful future. <coughs> and that hopeful future is not just, I have more money, I have more peace, I have more security. The hopeful future is more of God. And there's things he has for you that you can't even imagine. But God has it already. And going into prayer with him and saying, Lord, what do you have for my future? I think, I think you'd be just blown away by the goodness that God has for you. I think there's, there's healing that can happen in 2020 in relationships that have 
plagued you for decades. And you didn't know that God could heal that. But you'd never gone to God and said, you're doing something in that person's life. How do I come alongside it? You've just come into those moments thinking, how do I get through it? And you missed what God was trying to do. And instead of getting through it, actually say, Lord, you're doing something. So what is it that I can do? I remember distinctly, um, my, uh, I grew up in a step family. So my, I grew up with my dad and my stepmom. And I had a half-brother and a stepbrother, and then my actual sister. I know, it's complicated. Anyway, my stepbrother and I, we butted heads. Like, I hated Ted. That's his name, Ted Brightman. He's amazing. We're, like, closer than ever now. And I love Ted. But at the time, like, Ted and I just, like, we did not like one another. And, and before he went off to college, I was not saved, so didn't know Jesus. And I remember I got a knife out of the kitchen, and I threatened Ted's life because I was so mad at him. And, like, it was, a really, it was a really difficult situation. So Ted went to college, and I was like, great, you went to college. And then, and then I got saved. I got radically saved, humbled. God healed me of my anger. It was just, it was a huge thing. And then I remember Ted got back from college, and he was a little skittish, right? Because the last time he saw me, I wasn't really that nice to him. <laughs> and so he, got, he graduated college, and he spent a year um, living in my parents' house and figuring out what he was going to do next, classic. And... Uh, <laughs> And I remember thinking, I was in high school at the time, and I was, I'd just gotten saved. I remember thinking, like, God, I love Ted, and I care about him, and I know you're, you're going to do something in him. And every moment I had with Ted, I remember I had this zeal, and I went into it just thinking, God, you're going you're gonna to change this relationship, and I'm just going to step into the moment, and I'm, I'm just going to say, Lord, what do you have for me? How can I be present with Ted? I remember that for a year, I was just like, you're going to the store, I'm going with you. You're doing this, I'm doing it with you. And, in, and for six months, Ted's like, this is weird. Like, why do you like me? You know, like, this is, like, I'm, and then over time, I just began to tell him, like, man, I love you. You're my brother. I care about you. I want a relationship with you. I'm so sorry for what I did in the past. And then Ted and I became really close friends. And we're more alike than we ever knew. But what it took was not Ted changing. What it took was me changing and recognizing God was going to do something in Ted as I just loved him. There wasn't huge moments where I'm like, Ted, you need to come to Jesus, and here's what Jesus did for you, and this is what happened. I just showed up in his life. And, and, I, just was, and I listened to him, and I told him the truth. And then I didn't get bent out of shape when he didn't reciprocate all the care I was giving him, i.e. the results and Ted and I, man, like there's, I mean, tomorrow night when the Seahawks play Minnesota, Ted and I are going to text the entire time because he's a huge Seahawks fan. And Ted was his major sports. He's still a huge sports fan, and I wasn't at, at the time. But now Ted and I we talk all the time. And that happened because I listened to the Spirit. I just encourage you, like that was years of a broken relationship that got healed. God can do that. And God wants to use you to do that. And it's not going to take anything more than be present. Show up in that moment. I think we can do that, church. So as we dig into this, th this hope for this season is that we're trusting in what God can do. What has God done in the past? What is God going to do in the future? And then finally, God is doing something in the present moment that we just need to come alongside. And, and I think this first candle of hope, we have hope because God's already been at work. And what you think is a massive challenge, God has already done all the work. He just needs you to do the one last thing. That one last thing of just be present in that moment and watch as God's already paved the way, but he wanted you to participate. Your heavenly father wanted you to participate in changing that person's life this season. But it takes actually being present. I want to invite Jeff up, and I want to move into a time of, of response and communion. And I think as, as we get this opportunity to, to respond, communion's over here on the uh, right and the left. And, and I want us to be thinking as we take communion about these three things. You know, what, what hits you? Do, you? do you look back and see how good God's been? Is there a hopeful future you actually have to start dreaming about? Or maybe you haven't been present here. Maybe you showed up and you've been listening to me but you're not going to the Lord and telling him the truth. And I encourage you, as we go to take communion, tell the truth. 
God can handle it. There is, you will never be angry enough or mean enough or say, you could say every swear word you want to say to God, he's never going to be offended. God already knows it, but he wants to have that conversation with you. And don't get attached. Know that God's working. I don't want you to leave here thinking, well, Pastor Stephen said that and nothing happened. No, God's at work. And you watch as God does something this week. So I'm going to pray, and then we'll get up, and we'll, we'll, take, uh, we'll get the elements together, and then we'll receive communion together in our seats. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you that, Jesus, you, you were prophesied of in the past, and you came. Jesus, that you died on the cross in our place for our sins. You rose again on the third day, defeating our greatest enemies. Already done. Satan, sin, death. Jesus, our future is taken care of. But you want us to bring heaven into these moments. And so I pray, Spirit of God, lead us in this moment that heaven would be here, that healing would happen, that the grace would come, that, that, that honesty would happen between you and, and your kids right now, God. Heavenly Father, be, be present here in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen.